Uh, my name is Paul Rubin. Uh, I was one of uh, about 80 people who completed their entire training with Dr. Feldman Price. And this was a class of San Francisco 1975, graduating 1977. And um, I had the good fortune to have a, a very nice relationship with Dr. Feldman Kreis um, as a very young person uh, with a much older mentor. So uh, it was uh, it was a, a, a great gift to me in my life and very, very important to me. So the story I've chosen to tell is a bit layered. It's in the context of my first meeting with Dr. Feldenkrais. It's in the context of how he addressed my own interest and stimulated my own interest in his method and how that developed. So I'll just begin. In 1973, I was running a program in Canada under a grant from the Department of National Health and Welfare uh, to work basically as a street program and to run an alternate school for kids who'd left school, some of whom were on the street, some of who'd been expelled or dropped out of, out of high school. Uh, they graciously consented to offer to send me to the Esalen Institute in Big Sur for a month-long study program in Gestalt Therapy which had grabbed my interest as a way of dealing with adolescents who were not particularly forthcoming uh, in an authoritarian type counseling or therapy session and to give them the power and to, to be able to guide their exploration um, very, very gently and according to their self-expression and needs. So I was in this program uh, down in Big Sur as a as a young person, I guess I was 23 or 4. And a lot of it was very new to me. We were secluded on the campus of this very lovely place, uh, our study group, in a separate building, a little bit apart from the main campus. And we cooked our own meals and we had our own little garden and so on. One night for dinner, who should appear? but a man named Moshe Feldenkrais. He's coming for dinner and to observe our evening training session in Gestalt Therapy. Now, I never heard of Moshe Feldenkrais before. I didn't know anything about him, and he certainly didn't know anything about me. Still, I was practicing in those days being a less shy, a less introverted, less socially fearful person. And I struck up a conversation with uh, Moshe Feldenkrais in the kitchen, sort of basically, well, what do you do? And, and it was very interesting. He didn't want to say a whole lot about what he did. And I just, well, he told me some stories about his, about his life very briefly, just a kind of bio, including the fact that he'd been in Paris um, prior to the, uh, to the Second World War and maintained connection there certainly afterwards. Well, a cousin of my father's uh, was prominent in the Jewish community there. He uh, wrote and, and edited a Yiddish newspaper in Le Marais, the, uh, the Jewish then Jewish section of, of Paris for a long time, a ghetto, um, you know, from, from, from uh, centuries ago. And uh, I said, oh, you know, I have a cousin there who, 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 who uh, publishes a newspaper. He said, who's that? And I gave the name. It was Mendel Mann. And he said, oh, you know Mendel Mann. And I said, well, I don't. He's my father's cousin. Well, he's very famous in the Jewish community there. Well, that struck up a, a, a little bond, if you will, a little connection, basically, uh, with Feldman Christ. Well, the evening proceeded and we went into session. And it was basically my turn to do my own so-called emotional work or psychological work. Now, who should also arrive because she had heard that uh, Moshe Feldenkrais was there? Ida Rolf showed up. So in this working room, we've got Moshe Feldenkrais and his traveling companion and private secretary, Coleman Korentire, in those days, sitting on a bench in the back of the room in one corner and in the other corner of the room, there's Ida Rolf and her son. Son is what she called him. So I went through my, my stuff, which resulted in a cathartic episode, and um, the evening was over. Uh, I had heard, one of the things that Moshe 
told me uh, was that he was coming to see what this Gestalt therapy was about at the urging of Coleman Corentire, his traveling companion and private secretary, basically. And Coleman Corentire had performed that exact function for the founder of Gestalt therapy, a psychiatrist, um, Jewish emigre to South Africa by the name of Fritz Perls. Um, so Moshe had been talking about with with Coleman and later with 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 me about the part that he felt most uneasy about accessing in his method in his way of working with people to set up means of self inquiry guided and reflected as we do in F in Feldenkrais with our hands in FI and to set it up verbally in ATM. He found there was a, something missing in 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 in, a, in his comfort about how to do this in the part of human experience having to do with feelings. Now, those of you who do Feldenkrais recognize that what, a, 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 a formula of his, a very simplistic, and he recognized it as such, idea that in every moment there's an integration of four elements of consciousness. Sensing, meaning our sensation. Feeling, meaning our emotions. Thinking, obviously cognitive functions. And our movement or action. And he maintained that these things were bound together and could only be separated in language, could only be separated in talking about them. But in the organism, they were unified as what he called an integration. For those of you who are interested, you can go to the chapter Where to Begin and How in the book Awareness Through Movement to see a very nice account in simple language of this idea. Well, Moshe didn't quite know what to do with this idea of, 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 of having the emotional part of, of uh, uh, those elements, if you will, or aspects of, of human experience. He wasn't sure how to account for it. He didn't trust language in that area. He didn't trust language in, in many ways uh, because of how inexplicit, how symbolic it is relying on symbols rather than discrete signs that mean the same thing to everybody. And a great deal of skepticism about psychoanalysis and about verbal uh, classifications of emotions and verbal classifications of health and lack of health, this disease, which is what uh, the medical model of therapy, psychoanalysis and psychiatry in general is all about. It's, a, it's an illness model. And uh, he was searching. He was searching for something that felt right to him. Well, as it turned out, uh, he needed a ride in the late evening to the place where he was staying. And I had driven my car down from Canada and somebody asked me, would I take him? Well, I was still in the aftermath of this rather deep and cathartic experience that I'd had in this uh, practicum session. Uh, in Gestalt therapy, and I said, "Sure, I'll, I'll take him." Well, it was it was very interesting because I experienced Moshe then for the first time in a very personal way. Now, remembering that I was a very young person, nineteen seventy three would have made me uh, twenty four years old, quite still in my formative stages. The, I should say the early parts of my formative stages at seventy three. I hope I'm still forming. And he was showed incredible interest in what my experience had been of this session where I had ended up in a cathartic state, emoting and so on. He was very, very respectful, very, very interested. And he kind of listened very carefully to every word that I said and asked pertinent questions and um, was remarkably free, I realized later, of any particularly well-defined viewpoint through which he was looking at me or hearing me. He was just open to trying to take in what my experience was. Something I later learned was a hallmark of good functional integration. So he listened. He, he, um, he, had, he was very, very sweet to me, very kind. And um, that was that. Well, two years later, uh, in uh, 1975, I was uh, I had moved from Canada to study um, for my doctorate in psychology at the Humanistic Psychology Institute. About three months into my stay there, a notice came out 
that Moshe Feldenkrais was joining the faculty and would run this teacher training program um, and would also have a small group of PhD students. Well, I wasn't particularly enthralled with my PhD supervisor at the time, so I decided I'd check in and see what Moshe Feldenkrais had to offer as a way of working with people that made sense and felt right to me. On the first day of class, uh, as we were trooping from the first meeting room up to uh, another room, he um, he was withstanding with Coleman, and he, as I was climbing the stairs, he came up to me and he said, oh, yeah, you're, you're that teacher from Canada. And I was flattered and aghast that he remembered me and had a few, remembered a few details about our, our encounter of, of a couple of years previous. Uh, but again, it just seemed to form some kind of bond and, and, and also uh, the relationship of, of, uh, to my cousin Mendel Mann. Um, it opened, a, it opened a relationship with me, with for Feldenkrais, um, where we could eventually talk about the kinds of things that a student and a teacher need to talk about in an academic setting, because that was part of my relationship with him. Still, I was very shy, and Moshe was a very strong personality. Um, but along, uh, along we went. Um, this question for Moshe about how to deal with the way most of the, the medical and even the human potential world dealt with or approached the issue of emotional life was present because he would spend in his typical way time in class railing a little bit about the mistake that people made in analysis in imposing uh, a, a system of classification and it's very detailed system of classification uh, on another individual, which he saw as, a, as a, a matter of usurping their internal authority, their personal dignity, and bringing them into a system of thinking and a system of, of self-judgment that was external to them. Um, I had incidentally begun to study the work of Milton Erickson, the medical hypnotist. Uh, I found it through uh, a professor that I had enlisted to be one of my uh, academic uh, supervisors in, in psychology. Uh, uh, Dr. Irving Katz was his name. And I met several other people who were interested in, uh, in a certain kind of hypnosis as a therapeutic tool. Now, Milton Erickson impressed me very, very quickly with his, his similarities to the Feldenkrais method in, in the sense that he didn't impose on people. He certainly did in his experimentation. He had that side to him, and many of his papers were a little bit brutal the way that he treated people, at least I should say intrusive, if not brutal. But in his therapy sessions with people, he had his procedures, his methodology was to set up a situation in which people would come to sometimes deeply subconscious and sometimes quite conscious realizations of their own by having uh, a, a, a situation presented to them where these things could become evident, where choices and, and, and realizations become evident. Now, back to Moshe Feldenkrais, he defined uh, teaching as the craft and the art of creating the circumstances under which learning will occur, which is very different than instructing people on how to do things and what is what, and of which there's far too much has crept into the Feldenkrais method, says this old man. Anyway, I tried to talk to Moshe about it, but he had a little bit of a, a, a trigger uh, on the idea of hypnosis, because to him, it meant giving up control of one's mind to another person. He was very interested in the work of, uh, of Coué, uh, a French uh, psychologist who wrote a book on autosuggestion, which was basically a self-guided process. And Moshe was interested enough in his youth to translate that from French into Hebrew. Uh, he found it to be quite interesting. 
But this barrier of language of him just saying, oh, hypnosis, it's terrible and telling me terrible, telling me stories about how different people manipulated their, their patients with hypnosis, some of which were undoubtedly true and some of which were a bit fanciful. Anyway, I ran into a, a, a stone wall with him on, on, on that on that issue. Um, finally, having to try to break through it, I engineered in a kind of a devious way a confrontation with him. And he had, as the story goes, which is true, he'd asked us and basically forbidden us to take notes on his ATMs during class. Well, some of us who didn't have his memory and we were quite, I was quite certain he didn't remember what it was like to try to remember the things that he'd taken for granted after 40 years of immersion in his own work. I set up along some other people, a co-op where one person a day would sit out and take these, uh, take notes. And then we would share them. They gave them to me at the end of each uh, training year. I went to the photocopy shop because they're all typed and photocopied out 60 copies and put them in the mail because there was no email and mailed these packets out to people. The next year, the second year of training, I presented Moshe with a copy of this, trying basically to be provocative. And he accepted it and sort of hump, hump, hump. And, and, and that was that. Um, well, in that year, he taught a lesson, and it was my turn to take notes. So I had this foolish temerity to plunk myself instead of in the corner room taking notes kind of furtively, as had been our the practice in our group. I plunked when he sat down in the morning to teach a lesson. I pulled up a chair and sat down right beside him with a pad of paper and, and a pen. And he looked at me and he said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, it's my turn to take notes for our note cooperative Moshe. And he gave me a dirty look and he pulled his chair forward a couple of instances, uh, inches, excuse me. And my heart was in my throat, but I pulled my chair forward to sit right beside him again. And then he looked at me like if looks could kill kind of look. So he pulled his chair forward a couple of more inches and I just stayed where he was. So I was a few inches behind him and very close to his uh, right side as I was making notes through this lesson, which is a beautiful lesson. At the end of the lesson, it was, it was, it's one that's come to be called the windmill side lying and making circles with the arm overhead and opening the chest and noticing when the limitations of the structure of the shoulder girdle and so on demand that the head turn and lots of beautiful, beautiful detail, gently done, culminating in a lot of fun and a big movement, like many lessons. Well, at the end of the lesson, he gave a pretty long session of imagery in which he asked us, imagine that your spine is as long as this room. And we were in a big auditorium with a stage and the whole thing, probably 50 feet long. And then imagine the size of the vertebrae, each one, and reference your sensation to fill in the details of the, of the imagery and the spaces between the vertebrae, and so on and so on. Very, very beautiful. And then he switched and said, okay, now imagine that you have a spine the size of a mouse. And imagine each of your vertebrae separately and the spaces between. And he went on like this. And at the end of the lesson, as was typical, people would come up and, 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 and thank him for the lesson because something important had occurred to them or with them in the course of it, uh, or they had a question. On this day, it seemed to me a, a rather larger number of people came up and, 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 and waited to, to, to speak a few words with Moshe about the lesson. And it was high praise. And people were very excited about this lesson. When it was all done, he kind of turned and looked a little bit behind me, looked at me and gave me a, what do you think of that kind of look? And um, uh, I said, you know, Moshe, I said, that was a beautiful lesson. And the hypnosis at the end was just wonderful. Well, he exploded. He could see the color rising in his face, and he stood face to face with me. We were both standing and wagged his finger in my face and was, was, was a, a little bit upset. Well, I also knew from other conversations with Moshe where he had a tendency to want to be sure that people were not pigeonholing him as just doing yoga or just doing stretching or just doing exercise or just doing hypnosis. I said to him, 
this is the best I could muster in the way of uh, confronting my said, Moshe, I didn't say that that was all you were doing. And that was a nice bit of hypnosis at the end. I really appreciate it. And I'd like to talk to you more about it. Well, he immediately stopped and threw his arm around my shoulder and said, you know, I never said I was the first one to come up with all the things that I do. Well, the next thing that happened in this little saga that I'm hoping is short enough to keep your attention, but which unfolded in real time over several years, was that Margaret Mead, the American anthropologist, came to visit our training, and she spent a good deal of time with us a week, two weeks, I don't remember exactly. And at one point, Moshe came to me and he said, you know, Margaret Mead said to me, Moshe, you're the world's greatest nonverbal communicator, and you should really meet Mil Dr. Milton Erickson, who's the world's greatest verbal communicator. And he then he wanted to know a little bit more about Milton Erickson. Well, that opened the door even more for us to have discussions and um, it, which were, were very fruitful for me. He ended up taking Margaret Mead's advice, and he um, and she'd also been in touch with Milton Erickson. Um, and they they arranged a meeting for two days at uh, Erickson's home in Phoenix. Now, I was studying at the time with two students of Milton Erickson, one Stephen Gilligan, who was then also a very young man, now kind of a major figure in the uh, Erickson world in North America, and uh, another fellow who uh, I haven't heard much of in 40 years. Um, and they were invited to be at the session. Before Moshe left San Francisco, uh, and this would have been 1977, I said to him, I approached him, I said, I hear Moshe, you're going to see Milton Erickson. Coleman Corntire had told me. And he said, you should ask Moshe if you can go. So I went to Moshe, I said, can I go with you to this? And he said, no, just it was very flat. Now Moshe didn't find it easy to say no. And the way he said it, I knew that there, there was, it was important to him that I not be there. So it was fine. As it happened, his two students were there, and the day after the sessions ended in Phoenix, one of them came uh, to visit me in my apartment in San Francisco, and we listened to the recordings of the whole two days, and it was very interesting. Well, Moshe continued to be interested in this idea of how to deal intellectually with the um, the presentation of of um, or the the quality of life that we call emotional or psychological um, in language, uh, totally inadequate. Um, and we had a lot of conversations uh, about it. Um, and I saw in examples of his work that he did indeed set up situations where people could explicitly use the sessions to uh, open up the possibility of receiving and perceiving choices in how they're in their emotional habits, if I can put it that way. Um, it was it was quite a quite quite an important time for me and a validation of what became my life's work and um, a lovely acknowledgement uh, from Moshe that there was something that he was investigating in that realm. So that's one of many stories I have about um, Moshe Feldenkrais. Uh, none of this really took place in public, so uh, I hope it's a, a useful insight. As I say, I was very, very fortunate that he was generous to me as when I was a very young man with his time. And uh, there's plenty more stories about him to tell. I was never under the illusion that we were friends or peers. Um, he was my teacher. I was his student. I took him to dinners and to movies and to dance concerts. And to one time we were at the um, AHP, the American Humanistic Psychology Association meetings in Berkeley. This would have been, I don't know, 78, 79, something like that. And I picked him up at his hotel and took him uh, there in my car and spent the day with him. And there were some interesting stories about his um, being introduced to, uh, oh my gosh, uh, the inventor of, um, of uh, psychodrama. I'm having a senior moment. Uh, 
Um, and his response to Carl Rogers in a, in, a, in a lecture. But those are stories for another time. I hope this has been interesting to you. Um, I want to thank Cynthia for Cynthia Allen. Um, I'm proud to say she was one of our graduates from Cincinnati training in the, uh, I guess, graduate somewhere around the year 2000. I want to thank Cynthia for in, inviting me to share an experience with you. And um, I wish each and every one of you all the best. For those of you who are general public, maybe you got something from this. For those of you who are teachers of the Feldenkrais Method, I hope you got something more. All the best. Bye-bye.